Welcome back to more basic details about autogluon. So this is going to be a slightly food themed tutorial. Let's have a look at how to find the best food. Okay. So I might like eggs with some caviar, maybe somebody else prefers some bacon. And of course, vegetables are never bad. And maybe somebody is just outright decadent and wants to eat caviar straight up. And so if we wanted to use a genetic algorithm to find the best food, well, what we do is we, you know, cook a dish, see how it goes, then look at the next dish and so on and so on until we find something that works. And lo and behold, if we do this, well, the genetic algorithm will pick some bacon. But of course it won't just pick any bacon, it'll improve it such that now, besides giving us lots of cholesterol, it'll also give us cancer. Right. Now if we use reinforcement learning, well what you would do is you would again, you know, cook a dish, then you go and you know update your actions to adapt to the environment, and you keep on doing this, and so you end up with better and better you know, dishes, and maybe this time it's eggs because, you know, eggs are healthy. Well, to some extent, maybe sunny side up is even better. Okay, so you get this. But obviously this is, this feels quite frivolous and there has to be a better solution. And as a matter of fact, there is. Because you could just go and combine all the ingredients and you'd get a really delicious dish. Right. But obviously the question is, can we make it even better? Turns out you can, because if one dish is great, maybe three dishes are even better, so three courses. So you have a sequence of combinations. Okay. So probably by this point, you might think that I've gone mad because I'm talking about food and you've dialed into a tutorial about AutoML. Well, let's revisit those slides. And I'm going to walk you through the very same slides, just with different ingredients. We want to find find the best machine learning algorithm. And so I go and maybe pick a tree or maybe pick a forest or a deep network. And then at the end of the day, I use this and maybe with a genetic algorithm to find the best of those. And so maybe the genetic algorithm finds that the best thing is a deep network or rather that it's a very specific deep network. As a matter of fact, there's a paper on AmoebaNet by Realidal, and they use a genetic algorithm to find a good convolutional structure. And yeah, it works quite well. Now, if you don't like genetic algorithms, you could always use reinforcement learning, and lo and behold, somebody's done that too, again, with deep networks, and they end up with this rather bespoke construction as a recurrent cell. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because all other AutoML toolkits really also aim at finding the best single model. So whether it be AutoScikit-Learn or HTO or Tpot or GCP AutoML, Autopilot, AutoVaker, they all try to find the single best object they try to find a snowflake. We argue that there has to be a better solution, namely, rather than picking individual snowflakes, well, we pick an entire snowball. In other words, we assemble multiple models, deep networks, trees, forests, boosted trees, nearest neighbors, and, well, this works better. There's actually a nice benefit out of this. If you think about it, machine learning algorithms sometimes fail catastrophically. And it's not that hard to detect that. But if you can, and if you have a lot of different base learners, then you can just go and pick a combination of them. And so now the combination of those things will only fail if all of them fail. But, you know, can we do it better? Well, as a matter of fact, you can, because you can go and stack things. So you take an input, pipe it through all the models, you get the predictions as an output, you combine it with the inputs, 
and you get the next level output and you keep on doing this. And if you do that, you get auto -dorm. So the way how to invoke it is through three lines of code. You just import Tableau prediction as a task, you run the fit function and then you predict. So the key ingredients there is, well, you pre-process the data, you assemble, and yeah, you can optimize hyperparameters, but it's a little bit overhyped. And in the end, you stack things together. Now let's look at the modeling journey, right? So this is a, in a, from a review paper by Yao et al. So the human expert, well, defines the problem and does something to generate the data. And the authors quite reasonably argue that AutoML should really take care of everything from feature generation and engineering to model selection to optimization to evaluation and iterate suitably until you have something good. And then you go and deploy. Now we argue that actually you can combine a couple of things and it's really just ensembles and stacks. And you might want to auto detect everything on the feature engineering side, because again, this is tedious and boring. So if you're able to do these things automatically, you ought to be able to do quite well by default. Now, of course, there's no guarantee that these defaults are any good. So you need to let the user switch things off if they know what is to be done. Let me give an example of why you really want to be careful and think about what you're doing to the objects. So let's take something as simple as text, right? Because we can all relate to it. So the top paragraph is what we all would expect to see as text, right? It's, you know, from a novel by Dickens. And that might be just it. But I might also have, you know, Amazon product IDs, like in the line below, these are all product IDs for rather expensive um, fixed lens cameras. Or then, you know, there's a list of, you know, weights and items, you know, flour, sourdough, and so on, and to make some nice bread. Or your text might just be the label for an image, right? That it's a cat. All of those need to be treated rather differently. And if you don't, then you're going to get rather poor outcomes. So now we might say, well, but you know, at least, you know, we can treat all the text the same that, you know, the nice story. Well, almost because you might have English or you might have German, or you might have some elfin text. So now you need to have language dependent embeddings and maybe you might want to have some language independent representation and do all those things reasonably. Because maybe I don't have a terribly good BERT model for Elfin. Maybe I have one for German. So to get the point across, you really want to be able to auto detect a lot, but also allow the user to override and specify things when they are particular. Okay, now that we have that, well, what do we do next? Well, we just take decision trees, and you know forests like light gbm cat blues random forest from sk learn nearest neighbors and we throw this all together and get a decent model now we of course also need a deep network and we just you know take the best ideas from how one nowadays designs deep nets and well you go and combine right so you have separate embeddings for categorical text and images. You have ResNets, Dropout, Batch, Norm, Multiple Layers. So basically, it's really the standard repertoire of what you would use for deep learning. Now, you might say, well, that's great, but you have some other custom model that you've worked on for a very long time, and you would like to be able to include that. Turns out you can, because Autogluon actually allows the user to add their own custom model in order to make something that's very specific and optimized for their needs. Okay, so now you do this and you assemble things and then maybe you weigh them because you need to weigh in such a way as to minimize, let's say, the prediction error. Okay, so this is great. 
but this doesn't solve the entire problem. So remember when we talked about you know, cross-validation before, one thing you might want to do is, if you think about it, you know, training data is really precious. And if I use cross-validation, I end up throwing a lot of data away, namely the data from the validation set. But then if you think again, you realize that actually each of the models that I'm generating by taking one of those folds is different, right? So I use, you know, one of a of the data for validation, but I have a different validation set each time, let's say V or V prime and V two prime, V three prime. Now, if I do this, I could go and just average or otherwise reconcile the predictions from all those models. And that would allow me to come up with a more reliable estimate. And that's exactly what we do. So this way we get a pretty good estimate for how well we do in this case. But we also get good features <clears throat> either for prediction or as input in the stacking part for the next layer. Now, what does this mean in practice? So we have to complete data. We take in this case five folds and I take, you know, the data for the corresponding validation set and don't train on it. And then I just evaluate on this. In test time, of course, you take everything and combine it, but at training time, this means that I'm going to use the predictions that I obtain by training on anything but the blue chunk as features for the blue chunk and so on. Now, the result of this is that the estimates that are created on the validation chunks are conditionally independent of the labels on the validation chunks. This is great because I want to make sure I don't overtrain and overfit. So and in particular, making ensuring that I have conditional independence will give me the guarantee that the features that I'm outputting for the next stack are in order. Now, of course, in the end, you just average for generation. Now to stack things up, remember, we talked about that before, about combinations of ensembles. Well, you just take the input, you pipe it through all the models, you then concatenate to get some outputs and you keep on doing this. And by having larger and overlapping k-fold validation, will it also ensures that I have more reliable estimates of what the predictions for a particular observation might be. Anyway, so you get the outputs of one layer, there are the features for the next layer, and you keep on doing this. And the bagging helps also with the bias correction. So then, basically, I have something that looks very much like a ResNet, right? So I have, you know, input features first. Then the first layer I have Xi and the outputs of that. Second layer I have, you know, the outputs of the first. And the next one actually looks pretty much like a dense net. If you remember dense nets in computer vision, except that now we stage-wise train those models. And so if you want to know how well it works, well, you have to try it out. And that's exactly what we will do in the notebooks in the following few sessions. So sit back and enjoy the ride. Thanks a lot.